Thank you, Catherine. I feel like the lecture's already over because um, it went for so long. Uh, no, the introduction was great. Um, can you all hear me at the back? Is my mic on? Yes, great. Uh, the last time I was here was in 2008 for the Film and History Conference, and I'm very, very happy to be back here again. A really interesting thing happened to me when I left the conference in 2008. Um, I was travelling back via Wellington, and I stopped at Wellington Airport uh, with a colleague of mine, a guy called Adrian Danks. Some of you may know Adrian. Adrian's one of those guys who's very serious about most things in life, including travel. Um, so he and I were sitting there being serious, and uh, I heard this curious version of my name over the PA. Would Dip Verhoeven please come to the chicken disc? Okay. I thought I was a little bit hungry, actually. I thought, maybe they're going to give me chicken. No, of course they meant the check-in desk. And it took me a little while to figure that out. I got to the, chick the chicken disc, and they said, are you Dib Verhoeven? And I went, yes, I am. And they went, right, you can't leave the country. And I went, because? This is, a, by the way, not an unusual thing to happen to me. And because? And I went, well, we can't tell you, but we need to ask you some further questions. <clears throat> okay. So they call the police over. And the police come to the desk and they start questioning me. And their principal question is, have you ever been known at any point in your life as Darren? Pronounced slightly differently in a New Zealand accent. I said to them, listen, I've been called many things in my life, but I can tell you seriously right now, I have <coughs> never, ever been called Darren. I went, are you sure? I went, no, no, I'm really, really sure. I'm like, no, no, are you really, really, really sure? I went, yes, no, I'm really sure. This went on for quite a while. Adrian, my serious companion, was by this stage sweating and thinking that he was going to be arrested by guilt through association. Um, it was a very, very intense moment for him. And um, eventually they sort of took me into another room and they sat me down and they asked me a whole series of su subsidiary questions, including, at which port did you arrive in New Zealand? And I went, oh, that's easy. I arrived in Christchurch. And they went, oh, why didn't you tell us that? And then they let me get on the plane, which by this stage was virtually tax taxing down the wrong way. Um, there was applause when I got on the plane. Now, it turns out what had happened is I had been travelling under someone else's name because when I arrived in Christchurch, they muddled our passports up. So the, the person in front of me, Darren, and I reversed identities. <coughs> now, I like to think of this as a kind of instructive anecdote at many levels. Firstly, you know, clearly New Zealand loves me as much as I love it and doesn't want to let me go. Secondly, it's a really interesting moment of actually assuming you have a unitary coherent identity and having that shattered in a, a moment of misrecognition between uh, various airport personnel. And so, you know, in retrospect, you can be both yourself and someone else at the same time. And I find, I find that kind of idea of being more than yourself a really interesting one. And it's one that I kind of carry through my scholarship. And I'd like to think that, you know, the Film and History Conference at University of Otago had some place in this, this flourishing realisation around how important it is to think through these ideas about being more than yourself. Um, so with a view to not repeating the very excellent introduction we already had, um, I normally do do a quick introduction about myself. This is, of course, me many, many, many times over. And it's a really, really interesting image of me, not because it's of me, but because I think it alludes to this idea of what it means to try and be more than yourself. Okay? Um, and it's a classic image of a woman looking in a mirror, which as uh, those of us who are into cinema studies will recognise as a trope in the movies. Women look into mirrors all the time. I went and saw the movie It the other day. There's a, many images of women looking in mirrors in that film. Um, you know, all the classics, uh, I'm sure we can think of many. Lady from Shanghai, probably the penultimate or ultimate version of a woman looking in a mirror. Um, the image actually reminds me of a different film, though, and that's the film Being John Malkovich. Do you know that movie? Where John Malkovich, at one point, goes inside his head. He's in a restaurant, and he goes inside his head, and he looks out his eyes, and in the restaurant, all he sees are other John Malkoviches. And on the menu, every item on the menu is John Malkovich. 
and so on. And so I, I love that scene and it's a scene I think that encapsulates a very contemporary problem for scholars and possibly more broadly for the world in general. And that is, how do we get outside our own heads? Okay. How do we make connections based on who or what we don't already know? Because right. that's what this, that scene encapsulates for me and, and to some extent this image. How do we engage with and alongside people who aren't the mirror image of ourselves? How do we go about making those connections in contingent rather than binary terms, um, us and them? How do we think about the ways in which we're all changed through that process of connecting with someone or something that's actually beyond our own experience, that in some way is more than ourselves? And how do we develop a cinema studies that responds to those kinds of bigger philosophical concerns? And I think that's where I sit currently, which is in everything I do, in all the work I'm trying to do, is to try and drive that idea that there is a way through either our intellectual engagement, our institutional engagements, our technical engagements, our social engagements, our organisational engagements, and our personal engagements, that we can address that problem. How do we get outside our own heads? How do we do this in a way that addresses or redresses the divisions that currently mark this world's version of humanity? Not just by focusing on the connections between things and us, but by focusing on our capacity for making connections. And I mean that in those two ways, making connections and ideationally, how do we make connections? How do we put ideas together? Um, they're the kind of key questions that I think uh, are really the pressing crises that we face currently as a world. How do we think about coexistence in this world? Because we're not doing a very good job of it. Particularly my country, Australia, where we ship babies off to concentration camps on islands off the coast of Australia. That's one way of dealing with coexistence. I think Donald Trump has another one which involves building a wall. These are not sustainable or even moral responses to that critical problem. Um, how do we rethink that problem in what we do and from that learn to cooperate and co-produce an alternative version of the present? Okay. And I think that that's about fundamentally asking how do we take seriously the lives of others? How do we do that not at the level of belief, so it's not about distinctions of belief, but it's about meaning. And I think, you know, cinema studies has a lot to offer in, in relation to this debate, <clears throat> particularly in relation to the way we think about notions of truth and meaning and how they circulate through popular media like film um, and also through intellectual itineraries um, through the humanities. Okay, that's one way of thinking about me rather than the, the page of achievements and accomplishments, none of which I deny. Um, but I, I want you to understand where I think a lot of the scholarship I'm about to show you comes from at a really fundamental and, and base level. And so everything I'm going to talk about today kind of will re be reiterating those, those core, core problems. <clears throat> where I sit currently is somewhere mysteriously between cinema studies and the digital humanities. And the digital humanities is one of those interesting disciplines that's mostly debated in terms of what it is rather than what it does. Uh, and there are innumerable books about what is the digital humanities. If you go online, there's entire websites devoted to this. Of course, they're all participatory, so you can throw your own ideas about what the digital humanities is to those websites. I have two questions I like to, to propose to try and help understand what the digital humanities is. In fact, it's one question with two answers. In fact, there are probably many answers, but the one question is, how many digital humanities scholars does it take to change a light bulb? And the answer is two. One to change the light bulb and the other to tell you that you aren't a real digital humanities scholar unless you made the light bulb yourself. And what that alludes to is the idea that the digital humanities are very um, focused on the doing of the humanities. Okay, so they're very interested in lifting method up to the surface of the discussion of what the humanities is and what it can do. Okay. 
Um, and it's a kind of a, a really interesting and good new problem for the humanities to have. Okay, I'm going to ask the question again. So how many digital humanities scholars does it take to change a light bulb? And the alternative answer is one, um, but no humanities scholar is ever going to trust a single light source. And what that tells you is that the digital humanities does extend some of the core concerns of the humanities, okay, which is great, and they are things like interpretation, contestation, that idea that we produce knowledge through processes of contestability, uh, rather than something the sciences might value like reproducibility. Um, in fact, I often debate this with my science colleagues who tell me that we have to have open data for reproducibility, and I'm like, yeah, and you know, we have a word for that in the humanities, and that's called uh, plagiarism. So uh, we'd rather kind of think about something like contestability as a catch-all phrase that includes the idea that you should have reproducibility at a certain level, but only for the purpose of interpretation and contestation. Um, so there's a number of kind of core concerns around the humanities that I think the digital humanities are very interested in preserving. This is another one, complexity. The humanities does complexity very, very well. Uh, and in fact, we prefer to make things more complex rather than simpler um, as a general, very, very broad generalization. This is something, again, that I think uh, we lose sight of and that the digital humanities is brought back up to the surface in this focus on what is it that we do and how do we do it. So we do complexity, we do contestation, we do collaboration. Um, we do a number of very interesting things that um, we don't necessarily get to see in terms of the new digital tools that are coming online for us to work with. So uh, a good example of some of those limited tools are things like Google, which is a simple single t search box. That's very uh, straightforward kind of process of engaging with information. Um, the web itself. So I don't know if any of you know about the prehistory of the web, but the prehistory of the web was a fascinating way of trying to understand connectedness and interconnectedness. And what we ended up with is the dumbed down version of that, <clears throat> which is really, really quite simplistic. You can link from one thing to another and only in one direction, and you can't know what the nature of the link is. You just get to do it. Um, that wasn't necessarily the original vision for hyperlinking or hypertext. Um, one of the ways I try and describe some of these things is through this visualization. So you might recognize these ones. These are from Gaping Void, and the ones on the end I did. Uh, and what they try and show or demonstrate is the ways in which humanities connections are heterogeneous, they're non-hierarchical, so they kind of move around uh, in ways that aren't highly structured, like in here. Um, they can sometimes be non-logical. Um, if you think about the way in which serendipity plays such a huge role for us as scholars, serendipity is a form of non-logical connection, uh, as distinct from the kind of logical connective processes that science tends to favor, although, of course, there are stories of serendipity in science as well. Um, so a lot of this thinking went into a big tool that I built that Catherine mentioned, which is this one, the Humanities Network Infrastructure, uh, which is a, a virtual laboratory that interconnects pre-existing information from lots of different sources. So it's that thing of combining heterogeneous data into one place and allowing people to make connections between things in that huge database using their own words. So rather than doing a search like you do in Google and getting, as a result, a list, an index of responses, what you can do in the Humanities Networked Infrastructure, or what we like to call Honey, is make sense of that list, give it meaning. So it's an attempt to elaborate meaning in the world through people's own words, not through pre-existing structured languages that are given to us by archival science or information management. Uh, so, in a sense, it's democratizing what we would call the ontologies. Ontologies are ways in which we imagine the world is joined up and fits together. Okay. What would happen if we let people describe the world that they lived in using their own words rather than the words provided to us by a 19th century archivist or an early 20th century archivist who decided how the world fitted together? Um, this is the website. You, anyone can go and play 
Uh, you only need a social media account to log in. We don't have rigorous user management system or anything like that. We don't keep your data. You can create collections. You can link things together, like I said before. Um, at the moment, uh, we're just testing the possibility for you to add your own data so that you can throw that into the mix as well. And you can make it all public. So when you make a collection, this is what a scientist did when they made a collection. They, the collection is in the center and they just dumped everything in and there was one level of distance between the, the collection itself and the information it contained. This actually broke Honey because we didn't think anyone would do this because it was so alien to the way we thought people would work. What people normally do if you're a humanity scholar is something that looks more like this. Um, so what this is, is a collection that I built around Kenji Hall, the Australian filmmaker from the 1930s mostly, although he had a, a long career in television as well. And it shows all the entity records that I put into that collection and how they interconnect. And then, fascinatingly, it got interconnected into someone else's collection. Uh, and we didn't realize that that would necessarily happen. Of course, theoretically, it was always going to happen, but we hadn't kind of thought that up front. So serendipitously, we discovered the properties of serendipity in Honey, where my pathway through knowledge interconnected in a structured but unexpected way with someone else's information. So it's a little bit like the experience of walking through the library towards something and then seeing something else out of the corner of your eye that is actually the thing you really wanted but you didn't know it at the time, right? Um, we, we feel like that we've now kind of provided that uh, in Honey using the crowd rather than an information system that's managed through a structured vocabulary. Um, so we call this a vernacular ontology or a socially linked data system. Uh, and the most important um, dot point, because there's a lot of text on the slide, is the bottom one, which is this idea that uh, we want to open researchers to the expressive, the ephemeral, the associative. So when you describe the relationships between things, you're not limited to simply saying, is the same as, or is the brother of. You can say, is the evil twin brother of, or uh, is sort of similar but not quite the same because it actually has this property and this property that are different. You can use all your own words in that sense. Um, so it's still a, what we call a triple structure, but it, it gives you a lot of nuance in the way you describe the relationships. It also gives you one thing that most information systems can't, which is the ability to say not. Okay. It is not related to something. Okay. Most information management systems are built around a notion of the world that's present, has okay, so a kind of positivist view of the world, not a view of the world that enables contestation, where you can say, no, it's not true, or it is not the fact that, or she is not the sister of, or he wasn't an evil twin. He was lovely. I met him twice. You can say whatever you like, including the word not. And this is a kind of revelation for information management systems. It's one of the kind of unique things about this particular discovery service. And of course, then there's the conceptual resonance that this has, which is that we don't build bridges simply to avoid walking on water. This is not an exercise in efficiency. This is not an exercise in rationalization or simplification. What Honey is trying to do is preserve complexity and enable it, but in a way that creates more meaning, not confusion. Okay. In that sense, I think this, this is a kind of really good project that, that led into the second project I want to talk about, which is the kinematics project, my big data project. Um, and this is a project uh, that deals with enormous amounts of Showtime data, so film screenings from all around the world. Um, there's 350 million showtimes in the database, um, sourced from about 51 countries over a two and a half year period. Pretty much every movie screening in every cinema in the world. Now, I know there are more than 51 countries, but we cover something like 96% of the cinemas of the world, so it's pretty good coverage. Is 350 million showtimes big? Is it big data? Does anyone think it's big? Yes, yes thank you. Um, 
I like to think that uh, the focus on the big in big data, which you often hear about from guys in science, is not necessarily the best way to approach big data. I think big data should be defined as, and usually is defined as, data that in any given context is too large and is therefore ungraspable or incomputable using conventional methods. And what that means is that my big data might not necessarily be your big data. Okay. To a, an astronomer, this is not big data. Okay. This is tiny, tiny data. In fact, it doesn't even take up a great deal of server space because it's just metadata. It's just records of screenings. There's no audiovisual data, for example, which actually churns server space. Um, it's probably not going to be big data next week when someone discovers a new computational system that will actually crunch through it much more quickly. So I'd like to rethink the way we define big data. I think the way we should be thinking about big data is that if big data hasn't caused you to have an existential crisis, it probably isn't big data. Okay. If big data hasn't challenged you to think beyond yourself in some way, in the sense that it's unfathomable, unmobile, unfathomable or ungraspable, I'm going to go with ungraspable because it's easier to say, um, if it hasn't challenged you to think beyond your own capacities, then it's not big data. Okay. Uh, big, it's, big data is big data if it asks you to reconsider your place in the world, how you fit in, and how you have to rely on other people or other things like artificial intelligence to help you process it. So big data constantly defies the notion that we have a singular approach to understanding the monumental detail and the infinitely interconnected nature of the world. Okay. It's ramifying and it has ramifications and it implicates us quite personally. So you need to work with people other than you to even get at it. These are the people I work with. Colin is a geospatial scientist. Stuart is a network engineer. Bronwyn is a cultural economist. Uh, ben is a policy, cultural policy analyst. Sarah is a data scientist and also has a background in geospatial science. Alwyn was a cartographer. And June is our PhD student who pretty much does everything. She's you know, just a polymath, basically. Uh, she's fantastic. Um, anything I say about any of the research that comes forward is a product of all of us working on it in some, some way or making some kind of contribution to it. So I don't want to kind of take personal credit for, for the observations I'm going to make. Um, in the project, we've run lots of different types of analyses. Um, probably here the most interesting ones are the reciprocity in the film industry project, this one, uh, which I spoke about last year at the, the film and history or the screen studies conference. Um, this was a, an approach to big data that was attempting to rethink what big data can show us that doesn't that isn't what we already know. So that for about two years after working with this data, I realized that pretty much everything I was analyzing, I could have found out any other way. I didn't need to be working with big data to find it out. A good example is uh, our data coincides with the release of The Hobbit, all three versions of The Hobbit. So we started tracking The Hobbit. And of course, what we discovered is that The Hobbit pretty much went everywhere very quickly. And then it kind of revolved around the world a little bit. And then it dissipated. And then the next Hobbit came along and repeated the pattern. We didn't really find out anything we couldn't have already figured out by just checking out Variety or you know, the local newspaper. I sat down in front of that data and went, what am I doing wrong? This is my existential crisis with the big data. What, what am I, how, how can I approach this so that I can actually produce knowledge that I don't already have or that isn't going to confirm what I already know? And I basically had one of those moments where I went, the issue here is that what I'm describing with the data is the domination of one particular industry over most of the world. What would it look like if we lived in a world without domination, which is the world I would like to live in? Can we look at the data in those terms? What, what can we discover inside the data that actually shows a different story 
than the dominant one that we can find fairly easily. And that's where this reciprocity project came from, which was an examination of mutual exchange of film trade. So not looking at unilateral domination by one national cinema over the rest of the world, um, but trying to understand how films might be exchanged more evenly between countries. Um, and fascinatingly, the country that is the most reciprocal in the sense that it has the most even exchanges in the world with other countries is Switzerland. Um, go figure. Uh, and Switzerland has a really interesting and high level of reciprocity with India, for example. Um, what else do we have? Chile and Greece have a highly reciprocal exchange. Uh, interestingly, Australia and Germany have a very highly reciprocal film exchange where the showtimes, the number of screenings in each country and the number of films seem to correlate quite nicely at the same level. Um, I like to think of the way we think about big data just for those that are, you know, are still trying to get their head around this idea of big data being something that's sort of in a sense beyond us but that also implicates us in relation to some other data not film related and that's UN data. The UN collected information on forcible evictions around the world last year and it came up with the magic number of 65.3 million forcible evictions in one year, which is a completely horrific statistic. To make sense of that, they kind of tried to break it down for people. And what they said is, if we try and understand that number, what we need to do is we need to think of that as being 24 people being forcibly displaced every minute. Or two people every time you breathe. Okay. If when you hear that, you find it hard to breathe, if you catch your breath, then I think you've understood it as big data. If when you hear that, you start doing a mental calculation, oh, I must breathe 12 times a minute, then you're thinking of it as small data, as something very partitioned and consumable and broken down into smaller bits. The big data part of that is the bit that implicates you as part of the breadth of what it is that it's trying to actually address, which is the problem of, a you know, critical problem of humanity. Um, and that is how we coexist uh, under current circumstances. You can't work with big data without yourself leaning into an interconnected world and without recognising that your disciplinary outlook is in every aspect touching some other. That's what I think the story of big data is. One of the things, one of the other projects we were working on with big data is this one, which is an attempt to think about how we might reshape the world using data, rather literally. So this is a, a little animation of comedy films around the world. And what it shows you is in those places where comedy films are shown more often than the average, uh, you'll see a, a topographical peak. And in those moments where they're shown less than average, you'll see a valley. Okay, so this is an attempt to do a sort of an analysis of a cinema topography of the world. What would the world look like if the mountains were cinema screenings, not physical mountains? Okay, let's have a look. This is Europe. Now, I want to draw your attention to Italy here, which of course is laughing a lot, and the UK, not laughing. Okay. This data comes from just pre-Brexit. I think, I think we can see a correlation there, but you know, I'm not going to call it. <laughs> and there we go. So this was a very early attempt, it's quite crude. Um, on our part to try and think about how we can actually engage with the data differently and try and find new ways of understanding and redefining what, for example, something like the global might mean. Uh, how does big data also rely on a rethinking of some of those concepts around universals or largeness or globality as well? That's kind of going to lead me now to the final project I want to present to you today, which is a project about also thinking about the shape of the data. Um, and this is a project quite close to my heart. And I want to start by just pointing out 
the influence on this project of this guy, Samuel Plimsoll. Samuel Plimsoll uh, was a, uh, I guess, mostly known for being a politician in 19th century England. And he's very famous. He's known as the sailor's friend. Uh, he's very famous for developing something called the Plimsoll Line. The Plimsoll Line is a line drawn on the side of a ship to indicate how much weight the ship could take safely uh, in order to traverse ocean trade, trade routes, essentially, but also sometimes passenger routes. And the reason it was a very important initiative in the 19th century was because uh, unscrupulous shipping barons were overloading ships deliberately to sink them for insurance purposes. And in the course of doing that, were killing crew. They were known as coffin ships and sometimes passengers. So many of their ships were, in fact, ships that would take the route to Australasia from London. Um, and significant loss of life would occur on these ships because they were overloaded. So the Plimsoll line was developed by Samuel Plimsoll and another guy, uh, I think his name was James Hall, who uh, used a lot of data. So they went in and collected all the data on weights, the uh, breadth of the ships themselves, the buoyancy of the water, and so on, and developed quite complex tables um, using that data to determine a safe flotation point or a buoyancy point for a ship. Hold that thought, because we're going to come back to Samuel Plimsoll in a minute, um, in the course of talking about this, which is gatekeeping in the Australian film industry and more latterly in several other industries as well. This is a project I've been working on called the Gender Offender Project. And it's another one of those projects that comes from an intense cr crisis moment. Could be an existential crisis. It's probably a midlife crisis moment um, between me and the data. And it's, uh, I think, instructive of the ways in which I work best when the data does, in fact, implicate me as well, um, quite explicitly. Last year, I was sitting at my desk and the um, data from Screen Australia describing the participation rates of women in the Australian film industry was released. And the data was appalling. Okay. I cannot underestimate how bad it was. It was not just bad, it was worse than when I started as a lobbyist in the Australian film industry 30 years ago. And I had a complete midlife crisis meltdown. I sat there saying to myself, what a life wasted. I have spent 30 years advocating for one thing, which is the inclusion of minorities in the Australian film industry. And not only did I fail, it got worse. Okay? It got worse. That's me in 1987 protesting the closure of the Women's Film Fund. That's me there. That's the film festival I was running that year. That's Ronald Reagan. That's Patricia Neal. 10 out of 10 to anyone who can name the movie. No, nah, you're all out. The hasty heart. Um, this is, and can I just point out how much better I was at graphic design than whoever ran the Victorian Women's Liberation Newsletter? <laughs> you do that. <laughs> um, I'm sitting in front of my desk going, okay. A myriad, you know, enormous number of thoughts are occurring to me all at once, not the least of which is my midlife crisis moment, which is, is a moment of both hubris and despair. It's hubris because, of course, it's not just about me lobbying the, the, the entire film industry, but that's how it felt at the moment. Um, and despair because, yes, it was terrible. I decided immediately that I wasn't going to release the data again because after 30 years of consistently bad data, you have to accept that the data itself is having an influence. The data has a power. It's a disincentive for women to continue to apply when they constantly see that there's not really any point or any sense of equitability. First thing. So just park that there. Second thing, we're asking the wrong question. After 30 years of dealing with bad data, what are we doing wrong? We're asking the wrong question. We're looking at the wrong thing. We've been focused on looking at the problem of women how to improve women, how to give them mentoring, how to give them special funds, how to give them a leg up, coaching, whatever. Women aren't the problem. Okay. What we should be looking at 
are the patterns of behaviour being displayed by the beneficiaries of the system, in the case of this data, men. Okay. Why aren't we looking at what they're doing? And so I decided to do that. And I did that also because the Australian film industry's response, aside from the mentoring and the special funds for development, not production, and all the other things that they were doing, was to uh, create an encouragement fund for women to work with women. And I knew, even at the anecdotal level, that was not an issue. Women work quite happily with other women. The issue, in fact, was my belief was the issue, was that men don't work with women. And that's one of the reasons why women are statistically outcast in the industry. So, oh, oh go back. This is a network visualisation of the Australian film industry. Produce, we call this producer networks. So the source node, these dots are called nodes. A node, a source node is a node that has a clockwise, what's called an edge or line coming from it. The source node is a film producer and the target nodes are all the, what we call creatives that they worked with. So a creative is a writer, director or another producer. So this visualisation describes producers, writers and directors. The source node is always a producer because generally speaking producers are the ones putting the creative team together. Red is men, blue is women. It's a bit hard to see with the lights but I think you get the picture that it's a mostly red visualisation. And what you'll see are lots of these groups of red dots. These are men working with men. Bazillions of them. Yeah, that would be great. Not working. Oh, that's volume. There we go. Ah, perfect. So is that a little bit clearer? You can see the red and the blue more, more distinguished there. Okay, so I'm looking at this thinking, this is great, but I want to go back to that thing I parked a little bit a minute ago, a little bit of a while ago, which is the idea that data has power. What can I do with this visualisation to change the situation? How can I use the data to produce a better form of analysis for change? Who does that? Who uses data to create change in the world, particularly around networks, gatekeeping networks? And the answer is the police and counter-terrorism agencies. They use data in what they call criminal network analysis to break up drug cartels or bust up terrorist cells. What if we did that to the Australian film industry? <laughs> this is how you do it. This is a visualisation of the men who work with men, what I call the gender offenders. So the source node in red is a man who has only ever worked with other men over a 10 year period. Okay, this is 10 years of data that we're working with here. The purplish dot is also a man, but it's a man who may have at some point in that 10 years worked with a woman. So red are men who only work with men. The purpley ones are men who work with women and men. All right? So what we see here is 41% of the male producers in the Australian film industry who only worked with men. 41% okay? never worked with a woman over a 10-year period. 75% worked with zero to one woman in a 10 year period, 75%. Okay. What the police would do if they were looking at this is they would say, what we want to do is produce a less closed network. We want to open the network up. Because we know from previous studies that by opening a network up, people at the margins, women or other people who are marginal to the industry, have more chance of flourishing that guy there, he needs to go. Okay. I know his name. Go on. <laughs> you won't know his name. 
the guy in purple in the middle who's holding three clusters together. This is a hub and cluster diagram. I know his name. Okay. This is the beautiful thing about working with data like this is that it is both personal and it is political. It's the classic 70s feminism. Um, that's all very well. And I'm going to show you what happens when you do take those guys out in a minute. I needed to benchmark this data against other industries. Maybe this is just the Australian industry. This is the German film industry in the same period. Red is men. Is it? Oh, no, this might actually be... Hmm. No, it's Germany, yes. And these are the men only. So this is the German film industry, men and women. Hub and cluster. This is the men only network. You can see they made a lot more films in Germany in the period. This is the Swedish film industry. This is the men male only network. And look at that amazing cluster right in the middle. The reason the Australian industry, by the way, has that big blob in the middle, that's the film The Turning, which was a portmanteau film, so everybody worked on it. And I love that the visualisation turns around the turning. It's bizarre. Speaking of which, those guys in the Australian film industry who only worked with other men, 30% of their titles during that period feature a man in the title, right? Son of a gun or, you know, the king's speech, things like that. Okay, so they're all looking pretty similar, I think. This is my industry. This is Australian Research Council grants in digital infrastructure. Red is men, blue is women. Okay. When I first saw this visualization, I actually cried. That's me. I did get one, one of those grants, I was named on one. The amazing thing about this visualization is, with the exception of these two little isolated research teams, everyone's already interconnected. You cannot get a research grant unless you're already in the network, which is pretty phenomenal from a disciplinary sense, let alone an individual sense. I call this a bloodbath. I also call it a period piece. <laughs> and Tilda, shut your ears. Or a clusterfuck. <laughs> it's appalling. And we know who they are. An average team size in this industry is 12. Okay, the average team size consistently for all the film industries we've been analysing is four, which is why I'm measuring men who work with zero to one, because that's literally, on average, men who will work in teams in which women are a minority. In this instance, you'd have to be pretty hard-pressed to fill a team of 12 with only one gender. But it happens quite a lot. These are the men who only work with men. And again, it's a hub and cluster diagram with some clearly identifiable targets in the centre if I were doing my criminal network analysis. So you may think patriarchy looks like that. You may think patriarchy looks like that. Actually, patriarchy looks like this. That is the shape of patriarchy. And we can do something about it. It's not the numbers that we should be focused on, it's the values. Right? Instead of reproducing aggregate statistics about how many percentage of women are involved in the industry, we should just stop funding men who won't work with women. Okay. And we have the data that can produce that analysis. Interestingly enough, the guy that you wanted to know the name of that I'm not telling, um, a, f a colleague of mine cornered him at a party and told him that we'd done this analysis and that his name had come up on the top of the list. He made seven feature films without ever once working with a woman and that we were keeping his name out of the press. And he <laughs> apparently drained of all colour <laughs> and went, oh, really? 
oh, okay then, thanks for that. I'll, I'll look into that. And apparently the next project he then put up for funding did have a woman involved in it. So it could be an effective strategy if anyone was interested. Sadly, the Australian film industry is not interested in this analysis. Why? Yes, thank you. The laugh says it all. <laughs> I don't even think I need to answer that. I am banned from speaking on forums where any speaker from Screen Australia is present by Screen Australia. Right? They will not let their staff speak on a panel with me because of this analysis. Okay. Data has power. Okay. We're just not using it very well. And we could be using it much more effectively if, in fact, that was what we valued. But we don't because what we're really doing is a lot of lip service moving things around really to little or no effect. And we have 30 years of data to tell us that. Okay. All right. <clears throat> oh, this was uh, someone in the audience did this visualization of my visualizations. I always like to put this up as kind of a meta visualization. I think it's quite cute. <clears throat> now, I said we'd get back to Samuel Plimsoll, and I want to get back to him now just to, to finish up. Okay. Just looking at the three industries that I've been analysing, the Australian, the German and the Swedish. The percentage of male producers who work with no women on the creative team over a 10-year period, 41, 45 <coughs> and 46. The percentage who work with 0 to 1, 75, 75, 73. Right. These are outrageously consistent percentages over three very different industries. And they've caused me to have a little think. Does patriarchy have a plimsoll line? Is there a buoyancy point where we don't want to overload the ship of patriarchy with too much diversity, just enough to keep things floating along? I think there is. I think we will find statistically there is a comfort zone with diversity and it's about anything between 16 and 25% and the minute it deviates from that, all sorts of gatekeeping kicks back in and everything resettles again. So where do we draw the line at patriarchy? How do we expose the lines, the lip service that we can see? That's not the answer. Okay. Employment discrimination isn't about the statistics, it's about the social relations and we need to start using better methodologies for understanding that. Um, and one of those is network analysis of the kind that I've shown you. What we really need to focus on is the beneficiaries and how they gatekeep, how they maintain their domination or their dominance. So. What I've started doing is hypothetical analysis of what happens when you start taking these individual men out. This stuff has just literally come off the computer in the last couple of days and I haven't had a lot of time to sit with it, but I'm interested to hear your thoughts on it. I'm going to share it with you. It's um, not clear whether the, the data itself is going to be helpful. So this is the Australian industry working with um, the definition of patriarchy that I gave you already, which is men who over a 10-year period worked with zero to one women. Um, these are uh, very uh, schematic visualizations, not as pretty as the ones I showed you before, but they're actually describing the same data. Um, but what they're doing is they're analyzing uh, those people with what we call the highest potential for fragmentation. So they have what's called a Borgatti fragmentation factor, which you can analyze by looking at not just how many connections a producer has, but how many times a path moves through that connection. So it's a combination of those two factors, which is reasonably sophisticated, and that's pretty much what the police use when they're looking at drug cartels. So that top visualization there is exactly the same as the, the very pretty one that I showed you earlier, but focused only on that factor, that idea of who has the highest potential for fragmentation. 
If we take out the person with the highest potential for fragmentation, this is what results. The network resettles. And then if we take out the next most fragment, highest person with the highest fragmentation factor, that's what you get up there. And then this, and then that, and then that. So what you're seeing is a kind of se sequential analysis of removal, node removal. Um, and what it's essentially showing us is that there is some impact immediately, but effectively, if you keep going, you don't raise the fragmentation factor a great deal. Um, and that's quite interesting and probably suggests we need to think of a different technique for taking these guys out. Rather than doing them one at a time, we should probably take out a cluster of them all at once um, and we might have more impact. This is what happens in the German industry using that same technique I just described. Uh, and you'll see that uh, in this one, there's not a great deal of impact to begin with, but you end up, if you keep going, with a reasonable amount of fragmentation at the end. Uh, so slightly different networks sort of setting or sensibility here. And this is Sweden. Um, and here what you get is, again, very little movement from the sequential idea. So the next step for us is to go back and now rethink the strategy for how to change the industry. Uh, so maybe it's not about just taking out a sequence of actors, but it's about taking out a group of actors as a whole. Uh, and that becomes very interesting when we think about the, the hub and cluster diagram because if I go back just before I finish to... These diagrams. What you get here, which is quite interesting, is you'll see that there's a lot of clustering in the centre and then around the edges, it's much less concentrated. The, the little teams are sort of spread out a bit more. That's, they're, they're what are known as isolates in network analysis. So you have the, the kind of clustering in the middle and then the isolates around the edge. And initially when the police used to do this analysis, they would just ignore the isolates and focus only on the players in the middle as being the most important. Now they've revised that after many years of moving through this methodology and they've decided that the isolates are there for a reason and they're there to tell you that you don't have all the relevant variables. That there's something else at play in that culture that you haven't identified that connects those isolates into the centre. So I started to look at the Australian industry. I can't speak for the other industries. And there is, in fact, a common variable between the isolates and the people at the centre. It's not race. It's not age. Thank you. It's class. Bingo. It's class and it's private boys' schools, basically. This is literally an old boys' network. So going back to my conclusion that what we have to focus on are social relations, not numeric or data-driven statistics, we're not going to solve the problem of the industry by throwing money at something. We actually have to change social relations. And that's um, one of the kind of fundamental ones that needs to be addressed, um, particularly for the industry. So uh, I just want to conclude by thinking then about how we use data rather than just describing the status quo how we use it to understand and redistribute power. How do we redress domination in that way that I've tried to look at in relation to several data projects? That's all right. How does a view of power as delivered in networks as well as in hierarchies, as simultaneously decentralised and concentrated, compel us to rethink our assumptions about social change? This data is very powerful for me in terms of how I now rethink social change. It's not just about top-down ideas about how the film industry works, for example. It's also about horizontal relationships and networks. What does it mean to give shape to relationships? And can we recognise the quality of relationships by their shape? And if the answer is yes or even maybe, then what are the implications of this for how we understand both ourselves but also how we can redress the uneven patterns of interaction and coexistence that shape our day-to-day -day lives. What would happen if we could see, literally, the contours of injustice? What would happen if I could do that analysis on organisations before harm was done, which is how we currently measure patriarchy? Okay. We currently measure patriarchy in organisations like Google 
by waiting for the lawsuits or for the tell-all books or for women to leave or to be damaged? What would happen if we could use diagnostic tools to preempt all those things? Because we can. We can bring into sight structures of domination between people within organisations so we don't anymore need to notarise the vestiges of trauma in order to admit its existence. Okay. So that women and other minorities would no longer need to provide evidence of the discriminations perpetrated against them after they've occurred. I think this is a really interesting approach and I think it would lead us to understand some of the seemingly intractable inequities as both systemic and individual. And I think that's what's, what we've been missing, that sense of personal accountability in the industry. Aggregate statistics don't let people take personal account of their own behaviours. It's always going to be someone else's problem to solve, probably an institution, probably with a bit of money, a couple of mentoring programs. It'll all be fine. I think we can do better than that, and I think we now have the resources to do better than that. Thank you. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, do we have any questions? And please wait for the mic if you have one. Hi, Jeff. Thanks. That was really interesting. Um, just picking up on some of the points that you mentioned at the end, um, I was wondering if you could use this kind of um, data visualization for other institutions outside of the film industry. Oh yeah. Like Yeah, pretty much every time I give this talk, someone in the audience goes away and does it, right? Does that, does this analysis, and we've written it up as an open source method. Like we're really encouraging people to experiment oh, with it. Open uh, yeah, so we can't. I can't open source the film industry data, but I can open source the method. So we've done a sort of step by step how to on this, uh, and we've now adjusted it, adjusted the method slightly. So you'll see the those last visualizations where we're doing the hypotheticals. Um, they are a result of the fact that we took the data out of a very simple Excel spreadsheet and actually put it into a Postgres database, um, which enables us to create those hypotheticals much more easily. Um, so the first iterations that we did, those very, very first diagrams, they just all came off an Excel spreadsheet into a, a, a software package called Gephi, which is free. Um, and so you, know, you can use technologies that are to hand in order to do this analysis. So someone's doing it on um, public service data in Canberra. Uh, someone, I've just come back from Princeton, someone there is going to look at racist networks in the 19th century and so on. One of the things that um, I, I guess I need to advise on is you have to have a definition of what patriarchy is, right? And we have three <laughs> that we're working with because we're not really sure what patriarchy, how you would define patriarchy in data terms. So the first one is the one that we've just done the hypotheticals with, which is men who worked with zero to one women. Another one could be, uh, we can actually use the data to identify men who worked on teams that we actually know um, women were a minority in rather than on the average one, zero to one. Um, so we can actually identify which were those teams and therefore um, instead of thinking about zero to one, think about it in, in other ways. So if you had a really big team with seven people on it, zero to one might not be very meaningful but zero to three might be. So um, we might have been missing people in that way. And then the, the third definition involves the notion of roles because the film industry and research teams, but in particular the film industry, is quite interesting in that uh, a film generally has to have a writer, director and a producer and you can have one man taking up all three roles, right? So instead of just looking at unique individuals, you can actually look at the number of roles that have been absorbed into... Um, you know, one man's domain, I guess, in a way. So each industry will have its own definitional requirement before you can actually then start to look at the networks. So that, that I think, is an interesting problem that I'd like to see people start to debate or discuss, like what would patriarchy look like in a university as distinct from in a film production scenario. 
that's that's one thing. And then the other thing is um, not all um, teams are clearly evident in the way they are in a, f in a film where you have a creative team that's predefined by the funding agency. So you have to nominate all those people up front quite formally. So how you would define relationships then also becomes really, really interesting. And this gets back to Honey, the first project I showed you, which is that you know relationships are rich and complex. And one of my frustrations with the, this analysis it has great impact and it's really great to talk about, but you know, gender is binary. Not really, we know it isn't. So you know, this is kind of limited in that way. We can't identify the nature of those relationships, whether they're generative or dominant or whatever. Um, you know, it's, it's very simplistic. So it would be really great if we had better tools that could solve the problems we want to solve instead of the tools we're delivered. I mean, most of these data packet network analysis packages come to us in order to analyze the physical world um, through various different science disciplines. Or uh, in some cases now, um, Gephi is particularly used a lot for Twitter analysis, where um, you know, they're just looking at interconnections between Twitter handles. Um, I, I would like something richer, because I think that I, you know, I can get us to a place where we can start debating this stuff. But what I really want are better tools that will give me a lot more complexity. Yeah. Because otherwise, I mean, you don't want to end up saying patriarchy is just what men do, right? I mean, women could potentially be agents of patriarchy and reproduce the same structures hypothetically if they were to you know, assume the, the dominant nodes. How would, how would you respond to that? Yeah, is this just an effect of domination as distinct from other forms of gendered behavior? Yeah. No, well, the answer is in the film industry, of course, no, because we know that this is a global problem. Um, Sweden, I'm looking forward to doing some more detailed analysis on because uh, the CEO of the Swedish Film Institute, Anna Serna, has over the last three or four years achieved equity in their numbers, which we can't see at the moment in the visualizations because films take so long to flow through the system. So I'm hoping that if we get another tranche of data post her appointment, we might see a different type of industry. Um, and so, yeah, I am looking for exemplars of, of industries that are um, able to behave differently because they have different gendered composition. Do you think you'll be able to generalize uh, larger structures based upon more limited models of networks? Maybe, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, this is very early days with this kind of analysis, I think. I'm not, I'm not aware of anyone else doing this other than, as I said, the police. And, and they're, they're really interested in it in a very finite kind of way. Whereas if we're trying to think of this as how do we re, renegotiate the terms by which we talk about cultural behaviours or social behaviours, I, and I you know, completely take your point, because this could simply be, instead of patriarchy, just use the word dominant group, right? Like maybe, maybe domination is a, an effect that has its Plimsoll buoyancy point anyway, whether it's women or men. I mean, the, I guess for me as a feminist, I'm saying that for the moment, I'm calling that domination effect patriarchy because that's pretty clear. But you know, if this uh, colleague at Princeton does some work on racist networks, that would be very interesting as well to see what happens if you start analyzing white networks. Brilliant. This is removing one, then removing another, and then removing another. So it's cumulative. So you're still removing quite a number, just not in one hit, because you're allowing the network to reform. And I think that might be that's kind of interesting to me that if you take if you take, you know, the guy in the middle of the first visualization out, um, it does have an impact, 
but the network then reforms, as you say, around the skew, uh, and then you take another one out. So he's still out, take another one out, and so on. Um, whereas, you know, a bombardment technique might affect the network, it might shatter the network more effectively. But this is the problem. Hub and cluster networks are very strong. You know, in network theory, people talk about hub and cluster networks as being quite resilient um, because they do tend to reform around the skew. Uh, it would be really great, though, to see what would happen if we just took out a whole bunch. Like, top ten gender offenders. Boom! Gone. Probably read my mind with the Matthew Pyre question as well. Yeah. Um, just coming from an Australian, um, if you could comment a bit on you had an ARC grant and then you were told you couldn't sit on any panels with Screen Australia. Have you had any blowback from that? Because I know the ARC grant process is heavily, you know, if you can do an industry <laughs> crossover, that's where you're going to be, um, you know, favoured in these sort of grant getting processes. Could you tell us a bit more about how that's gone? I haven't, I haven't published the ARC analysis yet because what we, I was about to and then uh, I gave one of these lectures and someone in the audience went, I'm going to do this with NHMRC as well, which is the Health and Medical Research Council. Uh, and so I thought I'd combine them both and that way it also ease the pain of one institution taking the full hit. Um, look, I will, I will have to run it past my employers. I will have to run it past the ARC. You know, it's, it's one of those situations where... Um, it's meant to provoke a debate. I'm not seriously suggesting... I know someone once tweeted after this, Dev Verhoeven is suggesting we kill men. I was like, no, I'm not necessarily <laughs> suggesting that. That's taking me too literally. But, um, yeah, I mean, people do get the wrong impression of what I'm trying to argue. And what I'm trying to argue here is much more around individual accountability. For example, with the research data, why do universities persist in putting grant proposals up which are male-only teams? We all have equity charters. We shouldn't be doing that. Like, that just should be an... It's an easy give, right? Like, it's too easy. No, go back, find some women to work with, come back and resubmit. And don't even let it get up to the ARC. Once you're getting into the peer territory of peer review, it then becomes really problematic. But if you can gatekeep positively for women at an earlier point you sort of solve that problem. Um, so the idea with some of this analysis would be to present it to DVCRs in Australia so that they can actually have a look at their own practices. And I'll give you a good example of this in the film industry. In the, of the 75% of men in the Australian film industry, male producers who worked with zero to one woman, how many times was that woman on the creative team a director? Zero. Pretty much, yeah. One, and she was French and brought in by the distributor. So no, no Australian women, zero. Right? Directors are the litmus test for gender equity by a long shot. But So they never worked with why? Because you can add women to production teams, you can sort of add them to writing teams, but it's very rare to have multiple directors on a project. So they really are that, that kind of cutting point for the industry. I uh, was asked by the then head of Screen New South Wales to come and have a talk about this analysis. Um, because they, Screen New South Wales were quite receptive to rethinking some of their processes and procedures, as was Anna Cerner at the Swedish Film Institute, which is why I have all their data. And we decided we needed to address this problem of the directors, right? It's a really critical one. And the stumbling block, according to most of the producers we spoke to, is that it's not the producers themselves. They would love to work with female directors. It's the distributors. The distributors are saying, no, that's too risky. We're not, so women are perceived as a risk. So we're not prepared to sink our millions into that person. We'd rather have this person who has even less experience, but, you know, testicles. So, so women don't get the gig, right? So what we did is uh, the head of Screen New South Wales and I determined that a really good process would be to form ev social events where the distributors could meet some female directors and be less intimidated by them or not perceive them to be such a risk. So she rings up a distributor and she says, I've got this idea, there's four of you in, based in Sydney, why don't we have a party once every couple of months, you're going to host it and everyone will take a turn, female directors only and all the distributors, just so that next time you see each other at a social event, 
on the film calendar, you know, you won't be strangers, right? So there's a way of, it's a long-term strategy. It's not going to solve anything overnight, but it might build those networks and relationships that we don't see in the visualizations. And this guy goes, yeah, like, I'd love to do that because I don't have a problem with female directors. We, we um, green light them all the time. She went, right, you might want to check your data, but, you know, great, good that you're going to host the party. Puts the phone down. The phone rings two days later. She picks it up. It's the same guy. Oh my God, I am so sorry. I looked at the data. We have never greenlit a film with a female director. Right? In his mind, he was fine. And he had done that over and over. In reality, he had never done it. Okay. So there's a, a huge gulf between the perception that these guys have of their behaviours and what the data tells us. And that's that's where this sort of work has a role to play, I think, which is to stimulate people to look outside their own experience of themselves to get back to my theme. Well, I hope Screen Australia does sit down with Mr. Mm -hmm. Stone Point and we pull to the data. Yeah, I, it's probably unlikely. Any more questions? Okay, well, you're all welcome to join us uh, in the and of course we can ask more questions for Dan. So join me again. Thanks, Thanks everyone.